Love, Hate, and Propaganda, a six-part series with George Strombolopoulos, 70 years later, why World War II still matters. The end of a war is usually a time for celebration, but the end of World War II was also a time of deep sorrow. There was a terrible loss of life, and for many, a loss of faith. What were people supposed to believe now? In Germany, Japan, all over the place, people's beliefs came crashing down. They had been told to think certain things, and now they were told to think another way. So this episode, the last of our six-part series, is all about how the world changed again in 1945, how the end of the war in Europe brought new allies, new enemies, same in the Pacific and here in North America too, how the story changed in a time of love, hate, and propaganda. France, late spring 1944. Four years of Nazi occupation in France is a country deeply divided. The Vichy government and its supporters actually collaborate with the fascist anti-Semitic invaders. However, most ordinary citizens tolerate the Nazis just to survive. And then there's the resistance, an underground army just waiting for the call to arms. June 5th, 1944. BBC London transmits a series of cryptic messages. Their intended audience is across the English Channel in France. To most people, it's a load of nonsense. But for the French underground, the message is crystal clear. D-Day is imminent. The Allies are finally coming. From a military standpoint, the BBC played a role. It had been decided that coded phrases would be broadcast and upon hearing the message, the French resistance would have the green light to carry out acts of sabotage. The coded messages reach the resistance. The effect is immediate. French leader in exile, Charles de Gaulle, knows full well the power of radio. His 1940 speech from BBC London epitomizes the spirit of the French resistance. propaganda messages are actually looking to the future. They're talking about hope. They're talking about liberty. They're talking about freedom. And this is something, of course, that the French can latch on to. So who was de Gaulle? Well, at the start of the war, he was a relatively unknown tank commander who believed the French shouldn't cave into the Nazis. When they did cave in, de Gaulle knew the importance of keeping the message alive. And the only place to do that was England on the radio he quickly realized less is more. His speeches became events. Those who hadn't heard him directly heard about him from those who had. Word of mouth helped build General de Gaulle's reputation. De Gaulle's myth is growing, but the Vichy government and by extension the Nazis don't like it. They try to discredit de Gaulle by painting him as the voice without a face, a mouthpiece for Jewish interests. And for added measure, listening to de Gaulle is strictly forbidden. At the time, listening to Radio London was a means of resisting and it could cost you your life. If you were spotted or charged with listening to Radio London, you were potentially dead. The French are supposed to be tuned into Radio Paris, the official voice of the Vichy regime and its most important propaganda tool. Every propaganda machine needs a front person, and Radio Paris has just the guy to go up against de Gaulle. His name? Philippe Henriot. The Nazis love him. German propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels is a huge fan. In fact, he's the one who got Henriot the job. 
Onryo has it all, right-wing, anti-communist, anti-Semite. And he's a member of the Milice, a particularly nasty paramilitary force created specially to deal with the resistance. Onryo is also France's Minister of Information and Propaganda. And he gets to speak on Radio Paris every day, not once, but twice. C'est hélas que des misérables ont essayé de profiter de leur désarroi pour les entraîner sur les chemins sanglants du terrorisme et de la haine. Quand on voit Philippe Henriot, Philippe Henriot looks like a carbon copy of Goebbels. He is the French Goebbels, always yapping, spewing his hatred and his venom on Vichy's enemies. Philippe Henriot is the mouthpiece for the collaborationists. Philippe Henriot, c'est la voix de la collaboration. Normandy, June 6th. The Allied invasion is massive. The whole world sees these images, and it's patently obvious the tide of war has turned. But with Henriot controlling the newsreels, the French get a slightly different interpretation of D-Day. His ministry never denies the Allied landings, but anyone seeing these images could be forgiven for thinking there's no way a few boats on the horizon are going to crush the mighty German army. German soldiers based in Paris also get caught in the web of lies. They think all the French are on their side. Le Grand Rex, the grand dame of Paris cinemas, is now run by the Germans for the Germans. It's the one place in town where the news is always good. This 1944 film shows Allied prisoners being paraded in front of a hostile crowd in Paris. They may look like ordinary French citizens, but in fact, they're Nazi agents. It's pure fiction designed to boost troop morale. Pretty convincing. Henriot has his own message for the French. If you're not on our side yet, you should be, because these Allies aren't saviors. They're going to be the ruin of this country. He knows precisely which strings to pull. Philippe Henriot fait tellement peur. The Allies are scared of Philippe Henriot. They have to find a way to stop him. British Special Ops and de Gaulle come up with a secret plan. Kidnap Henriot and bring him to London. A resistance unit disguised as French police officers received the order to grab him. Henriot tries to grab the kidnapper's gun. The gun goes off and Henriot is killed. Une grande voix française, la grande voix de Philippe Henriot s'est tue à jamais. The who's who of the Vichy regime come out to pay their respects. The propaganda services use Henriot's death as an anti-resistance opportunity. Posters go up, streets change names, but he won't be mourned for long. Mid-August, the Allies, with a little help from the French army, are liberating village after village in Normandy. Finally, there's reason for hope. In Paris, posters go up calling for the mobilization of all citizens. Parisians take to the streets. And most Germans quietly head out of town. Resistance cameramen begin to document the uprising. The next day, 3,000 policemen side with resistance fighters and storm police headquarters. The backlash against Vichy propaganda is immediate. Parisians wrench cobblestones from the streets and use them to put up barricades. Resistance fighters take on the few German divisions still in the city. For now, the French are on their own. 
The Americans are in no rush to get to Paris, it has no strategic value, and they've no desire to get caught in the crossfire of a guerrilla skirmish. But for de Gaulle, freeing Paris is crucial. The French 2nd Armored Division heads for the capital. Church bells pealed throughout the city, sounding the arrival of the Liberators. Naturally, it's all documented on film. One of their first stops, Hotel Majestic, Nazi propaganda headquarters. Nazis are rounded up all over the city. The Germans have lost Paris. General de Gaulle finally comes home. After accepting the German surrender of Paris, he heads for City Hall to make an historic speech. Paris. Paris outragé. Paris brisé. Paris martyrisé. Mais Paris libéré. Hundreds of thousands of French citizens who have never seen de Gaulle crowd Les Champs-Élysées, hoping for a glimpse. Paris is finally liberated. The film, The Liberation of Paris, is edited in record time, and it's shown in cinemas throughout the city just four days after the Nazis have been booted out. And the film is meant to counter Nazi propaganda, but also to show France as a country once again united by its savior, Charles de Gaulle. Nowhere in the film is there any mention of snipers still firing on crowds outside Notre Dame Cathedral. There's also no talk of the supporting role played by the Americans in liberating the city. And only a fleeting reference to the reprisals against Nazi collaborators. On a pu se découvrir ces images là plus tard. Those images were only discovered later. The French had no problem seeing the worst of the collaborators getting roughed up, but they didn't want to see the more violent images of revenge and retribution at the time, because they were finally free to live their lives. Late 1944, the Germans are pretty much surrounded. They're taking a pounding from the Soviets in the east, British, American, French, and Canadian troops are closing in from the west. The heart of the Nazi empire, Berlin, is being bombed day and night. Meanwhile, Hitler's keeping a low profile, leaving propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels as the front man for Nazism. The Nazi propaganda machine has fallen on hard times. They don't have any good news to share with the German people. So what do they do? They turn to the lighter stuff, the daily life in the army, a soldier getting a shave on the Eastern Front, or members of the cavalry playing around. Fair to say that German audiences aren't exactly glued to their seats. People basically go into the theater, they see the newsreel start, they go out. So the regime takes a decision to lock the doors so that whoever gets in to watch a film has to stay in for the newsreel as well. So Goebbels needs something to stir German pride. He also needs more soldiers. He's got just the ticket to solve both problems. One last great propaganda campaign. The Volkssturm, the People's Army. All men from age 16 to 60 are called up. For the Nazis, it's the last hope for Berlin, a ragtag group holding down a crumbling fort. It's a very sentimental campaign. By 1944, uh, it is about a German nation facing the very real existential threat, particularly from the Bolsheviks. It is victory or chaos. 
Young Hans Münchenberg finds himself in the eye of the storm. At the outbreak of the war, he had been selected to attend the Napola School, the SS training ground for the Hitler Youth. My father was very much in favor of it. He had fought in World War I and was now a member of the Nazi party. My mother, on the other hand, thought that a boy of 10 was too young to leave home. But it was difficult for her to publicly oppose me leaving for school. The idea of getting ordinary citizens to fight for the country has been on Goebbels' mind for a while, an idea he stole from history, the people of Kohlberg's last stand against Napoleon's armies. But he'll need more than a newsreel to get his message across. While the country is on its knees, Goebbels decides to make the biggest blockbuster in German history. The film's pretty much got everything. Underdog town, evil armies, boy meets girl, cranky mayor, guns, cannons, and the complete destruction of a real village. Oh, and soldiers. Lots and lots of soldiers. Now get this, the German army is fighting a losing war on two fronts, but Goebbels makes the director use real active German soldiers for the battle scenes. Well, it wasn't hard to get him to set because the real front was getting closer every day. It's not just soldiers. Goebbels is squandering a vast amount of army resources just to get his movie made. Now, this sounds absolutely crazy. Uh, this was a time where the Germans had started fighting a losing war. So how, how do you divert all those resources? It became an almost totemic aspect of Nazi propaganda, that particular film, that it had to be completed. It was Goebbels' if you like, testament to the German people. By the time the film is finally finished in January 1945, not too many cinemas are left standing, and not too many people feel like seeing a movie. In the end, only a handful of the Nazi elite got to see what was supposed to be the grandest film in German history. Even Goebbels' most efficient propaganda weapon, the Wochenschau Newsreel, is drawing its last breath. March 22nd, 1945, the Fuhrer decorates members of the Hitler Youth. It's the first time German audiences have seen him in months. And it will be the last, the last of Goebbels newsreels and the last images of Hitler ever filmed. Remember Hitler youth Hans Munchenberg? A few weeks earlier, he had been declared too young and too small to fight. But now, with the Germans running out of cannon fodder, this 15-year-old gets the call to fight for the Reich. He wore the camouflage battle dress of the Waffen SS and rolled up the sleeves because they were too long. We had to fight the enemy so that we could bring about a change. They were a Nazi generation. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that they were convinced Nazis. Of course, you can't say that easily for somebody at such a young age, but they were people who were bombarded with all, with all those images, and to them, those images were part of their reality. So to them, to stand up for that particular regime was an opportunity to play a role in this final history-making struggle. It was their opportunity to be stars. But the reality of war is closing in. The Soviets and Americans meet up at Torgau, southwest of Berlin. They stage a photo op. A moment where both sides can pretend that all is still well between the East and the West, and that they are united in the fight against the Nazis. When the Soviets storm into Berlin, the Red Army dispatches 30 cameramen to capture the fall of the Third Reich. The finished film is released in several versions, including English. Up to now, the inhabitants of the German capital have known about war only what Goebbels has been telling them. Now the war has come home to them.
The Soviets attack on three fronts. In all, two and a half million men armed with 6,200 tanks and over 3,000 rocket launchers pound Berlin to rubble. While the Fuhrer hides in his bunker, his dream, his country, is crumbling all around him. It's clear to him now that all is lost and he doesn't want to be taken alive by the Soviets. On April 30th, Adolf Hitler shoots himself in the head. In his final testament, he names Joseph Goebbels as his successor. But Goebbels' reign as Chancellor of Germany lasts just a few hours. There will be no surrender for the Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. There was no future. There was no life worth living in a Germany in which National Socialism had collapsed and the Soviets were in charge. Russian soldiers storm the Reichstag. There's no doubt as to who's in charge now. Soviet generals sift through the rubble at the chancellery, hoping to discover Hitler's body. Instead, they find the burned bodies of Goebbels and his wife Magda. They'd committed suicide after poisoning their six children. Soviet cameras record the scene. May 2nd, a date Dr. Goebbels might have written down in his diary. Only he left a little early. Violent little loud man. Hum is the word for his Ministry of Propaganda now. May 8th, 1945. Germany signs an unconditional surrender. The war in Europe is over. But Hans Mucherberg is on the run. Injured by Russian snipers, he has found refuge with an old man and his wife. I woke up and heard Russian voices. The woman was showing the Russian soldiers my draft card, which stated that I was not fit for battle. The soldier shouted, you are a child. Germans are fascists. You should go home to your mother. The film The Fall of Berlin is shown in Moscow just a few days after surrender and in the US a few weeks later. It's a brutal, realistic account of the bloodiest battle in World War II. It's also proof that if Nazi propaganda has gone off the air, the Soviets are quick to fill the void. Look at them. Look at those hands. Hands stretched out to the frenzied accompaniment of vile Hitler. Now those same hands are outstretched again. The frenzy of hunger outstretched the bread. And the Red Army gives them bread. The Soviets, Americans, British, and French carve up what's left of Germany. Young Hans Mucherberg goes home. He would survive this war to see another, an even longer Cold War. May 1945, the world celebrates. London, Paris, Moscow, New York, Montreal, and Toronto. The war is over. Well, not quite. For American troops, there's still fierce fighting in the Pacific. But not everyone back home realizes it. The military brass needs to get the message across to the American public, don't get too comfortable. Fighting the Nazis, no sweat. The hardest part is still ahead. A 1945 film sets the new tone. If you think it looks like something made in Japan, that's the intent. In fact, it's all American. But the message is clear. The war with Japan will be long and bloody. Easy because you do not know the Japanese. You only think you do. And you're wrong. Let me show you how wrong you are. You have not yet faced the best of our armies. You have faced only 10% of our worst. There had to be a new definition, a more accurate 
definition of who this enemy is. We are prepared to spend 10 million lives to defeat you. How many are you willing to spend? Nothing had prepared the American military uh, to encounter this kind of, of enemy. The Japanese fought in uh, a very different way. What the Americans would say is the Japanese broke all the rules of warfare, of civilized warfare, if we can imagine there is such a thing. When Americans reached the island of Saipan, they discovered just what they're up against. Not just Japanese military, but civilians who have learned their propaganda lesson well. Take the enemy's life, or do the honorable thing and take your own. Since the war began, civilians have been in training, ready to fight and die for the empire. By June of 45, volunteer military service is mandatory. Kikoe Shiota trained in Hiroshima. We had to do exactly as we were told. If they said, there's a bombing practice today, it was impossible not to go. Women had to climb ladders, fill buckets with water in a relay to put out a fire. If I'd said it was stupid or childish, then I would have been labeled unpatriotic. In terms of propaganda, what, what an extraordinary tool. Every single Japanese thinking with one mind, every Japanese heart beating with the same beat. That is, you know, we're all going down together. There will be no negotiation whatsoever. Kikoe was living with her mother and five brothers and sisters. Like most Japanese civilians, her family is tired of war. They're also on the verge of starvation. The U.S. has Japan surrounded, which means there's no food going in. And to make a bad situation worse, the harvest for 1945 is catastrophic. We never had enough food. If my mother somehow managed to get her hands on a little rice, she'd put it in a large pot with so much water that the rice was swimming in it. When she served it, she'd tell us, now we have to endure this until the war is won. It seems the U.S. has Japan on its knees. Firebombing campaigns leave tens of thousands dead and millions homeless. The Americans are winning, but not fast enough for some. An all-out invasion at this point risks racking up American lives. A new weapon's been tested that could be the answer. Americans know the atomic bomb will change the course of the war. But do they know how much damage it will cause? Well, that's still open to debate. But they certainly know it'll be bad. So in an effort to give the target cities a warning, B-29 bombers carpet Japan with leaflets. Read this carefully, as it may save your life. Some or all of the cities named on the reverse side will be destroyed by American bombs. Heed this warning and evacuate these cities immediately. It's a lie. They just say things like that to confuse us. The reason I didn't believe it is that even at night, almost for days on end, there were lantern parades with slogans, victory, victory. So how could they say they'd drop bombs on us? Japan was the land of the gods, so we couldn't be defeated. There was a sense of being a unique nation, a divine nation, and of having a destiny which would then um, destine Japan uh, to dominate a part of the world. These are all elements, of course, that pre-existed uh, the rise of the military class, uh, but they were very skillfully used in the propaganda. August 6th, 1945. The sky that day in Hiroshima was blue, without a speck of cloud. More than 2,000 kilometers away, the Enola Gay is prepped for takeoff. Kikoe's younger sister, Mitsue, was to report for volunteer work service that morning. 
Mitsuo had said, I don't want to go. There isn't even an air raid shelter there. I told her, everybody else is going, so you have to go too. I made her go. The bomb they call Little Boy is released at 8.15 local time. There was a blinding light that flashed, as if a thousand magnesium bulbs had been turned on all at once. I thought I'd gone blind. I went looking for Mitsue. Then I saw something I recognized. A piece of cloth, material she used to sew pants for her younger sister. I saw the name. All I could say was, I'm sorry. Reports of the bombing don't appear in the Japanese media for three full days. That same day, August 9th, it's Nagasaki's turn to face annihilation. August 14th, 1945, Emperor Hirohito speaks to his people. If listeners are confused by the Emperor's use of archaic Japanese, they're absolutely stunned by what he's got to say. It is according to the dictates of time and fate that we have resolved to pave the way for a grand peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and suffering what is insufferable. The broadcast uh, was in this almost ancient form of Japanese. Many people, after, the broad, after listening to the broadcast, turned to each other and said, well, what did it mean? Many people said, well, it sounds like Japan lost the war. Though the emperor never says it directly, Japan has just surrendered to a foreign country for the first time in history. By this time, Kikoe's mother was starting to be very ill from radiation sickness. The doctor examined her and told me, if there's anyone who needs to see her, you'd better tell them to come. Just as the war is ending, Kikoe Shiota's mother passes away. The formal surrender of the Empire of Japan is signed on September 2nd, 1945, aboard USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Following the ceremony, 400 B-29 bombers, the same planes that had sown destruction over Hiroshima, soar over the battleship in the greatest flyby in military history. After six bloody years, the death toll is staggering. Over 23 million military personnel more than 38 million civilians. World War II is finally over, but the reckoning is about to begin. The war is over, but not everyone is celebrating. People everywhere are on the move. With so many homes destroyed, finding shelter is a priority. Many are concentration camp survivors, wandering, perhaps not even realizing they are finally free. When General Dwight Eisenhower is told of the horrors found in the concentration camps, he wants to see for himself. He visits Ordruf, the first camp liberated by the Americans in the spring of 1945. Eisenhower makes the visit deliberately. He says it's important to give a first-hand account just in case anyone in the future tries to dismiss this as mere anti-German propaganda. Eisenhower has journalists flown in from around the world. 
they bear witness to the atrocities committed by the Nazis in the name of race. But Ordruf was just a small operation, a subcamp for Buchenwald, the largest concentration camp in Germany, located just up the hill from the city of Weimar. For Eisenhower, it's inconceivable that the people of the city didn't know what had been going on. His troops round up the citizens and force them to confront the horrific truth that played out on their doorstep. Their idea was, yes, of course, the regime played a very important role in this process, but that regime had, as it were, infected uh, the minds of uh, the broad sections of society. So everybody had to be uh, denazified. You know, that included being confronted with the images of that past, being told that there is a collective guilt that is not just your leaders. To get the message of guilt across to all Germans, the Allies take over all media. Posters, newspapers, radio stations, magazines, even book publishers. Even cinemas are now under the control of the U.S. Army. The Weimar residents' visit to Buchenwald is well documented by the U.S. Office of War Information. The subsequent film is shown throughout the country as Germans are forced into theaters to see for themselves the atrocities committed by the Nazis. Under Goebbels' reign, cinema doors were locked to make sure Germans would watch the newsreels. But now, under American rule, citizens watch movies like The Death Mills in exchange for food stamps. They started the trip as though they were going on a picnic. But there was no picnic behind the barbed wire. Death was the only one who had feasted here. The Death Mills was put together from films shot by the Allies. But Hitler's boys had made a few films of their own during their 12 years in power. The Americans now scoured Germany in hopes of finding the evidence. These films shot by the Nazis would be the very ones to bring them down. And it would happen in Nuremberg. The city had been the very heart of Nazism since Hitler took power. Even though Nuremberg had been heavily bombed during the war, the courthouse was still standing. But the interior would need to be completely revamped to hold the trial of the century. They'd need more room for prosecutors and defense lawyers balcony seating for journalists, a box for cameramen and photographers, and for the first time ever... We will show you the defendant's own film. You will see their own conduct. The accused walk into the courtroom, what's left of the top brass of the Nazi regime. There was a lot of discussion prior to the trial. Who actually would be on trial? Would be the German nation or the Nazi regime? Of course, thankfully, in many ways, the uh, preference was to try the most important leaders of the Nazi regime. Since Joseph Goebbels was dead, someone would have to answer for the propaganda that had poisoned the minds of an entire nation. That man is Julius Streicher. Stryker was a virulent anti-Semite. He'd first met Hitler in 1921. Both blamed the Jews for all of Germany's problems. Stryker was the editor-in-chief of the notorious German paper Der Sturmer, known for its aggressive anti-Semitism. Stryker's publication reached a number of people. It was an identifiable face of Nazi propaganda. He represented the most extreme, the most aggressive, the most populist face of anti-Semitism. And from the viewpoint of the Allies in 1945, and also from Jewish groups, it was this kind of climate of extreme anti-Semitism that facilitated what happened much later. Now, as he sits in his cell in the Nuremberg prison waiting to be sentenced, Stryker feels no remorse. 
How unhappy I would be if I were not among these 24 main defendants, who are chosen by fate to be the victims of this great drama. After being found guilty of crimes against humanity, Stryker is sentenced to death by hanging. He is executed on October 16, 1946, along with nine other condemned defendants. But he doesn't go quietly. As he's led to the scaffold, he screams, Heil Hitler, a diehard Nazi to the bitter end. The Americans would hold other, lesser trials in Nuremberg and throughout the American sector of Germany. The Russians had their own take on denazification. The Soviets believed that denazification was a form of retribution. It was a process for seeking revenge. By 1947, both Russia and the US abandoned their denazification programs. Denazification was seen very quickly to be a process that could never really be finished. From the Soviets' point of view, the Germans in the East should no longer see themselves being punished, but should be part of their ideological bloc. And in the West, from the Americans and the British and the French point of view, Germans should no longer be put through a process of denazification because Germany was at the heart of Europe and was needed to be an important ally in the new ideological war. And in this new ideological war, the best weapon would once again be propaganda. The impact of World War II still echoes across the globe. Historians and writers find they can't help thinking about the present as they study the past. It's very easy to brand all these phenomena extreme, unprecedented, and of no relevance to us today. However, the more we study the Second World War, the more we understand that maybe the consequences were extreme, but actually the causes of the situation that ended up in the Second World War could actually be very much parallel to things we're experiencing even today. One war creates a ripple that continues to send waves out to us across time and space. World War II is every bit a part of who we are today. All these years later, are we still living in a time of love, hate, and propaganda? <laughs>